All right, Auto 2, we're going to be looking at charging system diagnosis today and talking about those items that come up in trying to diagnose and service and repair a charging system. So here's an alternator there, kind of cut away. Here we go. So common symptoms are a dead battery would be the most common symptom of a failed charging system. And that can be because um, you don't have to get an alternator that's not charging. Could be other reasons, of course. But... Related to charging system, we're thinking about those things that might keep it from charging the battery. We might be able to have an indication by slow or no cranking. Okay, so we turn the key and we get a no crank situation, uh, etc. Obviously, servicing the battery is going to be our first concern, uh, making sure it's full of electrolyte, clean connections, fully charged, etc. An overcharged battery um, can be an indication that an alternator voltage regulator inside the alternator is holding too high of a charging voltage and it's actually boiling the battery. So the electrolyte will start coming out. You'll see lots of white um, powdery uh, sediment on top of the battery and down the sides and on the fender well, etc., which can be indicating a, a malfunctioning alternator that is um, causing the uh, battery to be overcharged. Third, abnormal noises, so a grinding noise or squealing or buzzing. The most common cause is going to be up here in the front of an alternator, this very large bearing that you can see in there, and maybe you can see it on this side as well too. There's the bearing there. This front bearing is going to take the force of the crankshaft-driven serpentine belt that's pulling around it, yanking down on this, so that front bearing um, is notorious for going bad after a long period of time, although... It seems to be less and less common on modern vehicles because they've got larger bearings in there. Um, diodes will make sort of a clicking, buzzing noise, um, but there can be some kinds of noises in there. It could just be the brushes making noise, but typically it's not. Typically it's a front uh, bearing. So an indicator light on the dash, which is your battery um, warning icon, doesn't mean the battery's got a problem, but it means the charging system is not charging the battery. I think you know that at this point after Auto 1, etc. But that battery icon comes on, and um, most cars will have an amp hour rating of about 90 minutes. So a 25 amp draw on the battery will allow you, considering that kind of a draw, the car will run for about 90 minutes before the battery just shuts the car off because the battery's out of juice. So our first thing to do is give us a good visual inspection to look for uh, loose cables and discharge battery, et cetera. Let me just pull this over a little bit like that. Um, so loose cables, et cetera, um, corroded terminals like you see in this picture, um, a battery that's discharged, low electrolytes, we pop the caps, and we're looking to see if we have that meniscus where it's hitting the bottom of that cell tube about three quarters of an inch down. A damaged battery case, because maybe it, got, it has no bracket or it wasn't tightened or got pitched. Uh, belt tension on the alternator serpentine belt to make sure it's got plenty of tension so it's not slipping. And we're just looking at general wiring conditions so it hasn't been corroded by rats eating through, which is very common, or something like that. So next, what we're going to look at here is um, belt tension. So we want to think about, um, is the belt tight enough? And if we have a 12-inch span between pulleys and we push in the center, we want to see a half-inch deflection on a 12-inch span. If you've got a 6-inch span, it's going to only be a quarter-inch deflection. This is a pretty cool belt tension gauge. I've actually never seen one other than in pictures. And these, this one looks like a ribbed serpentine belt, these, uh, but, but a non-spring-loaded one, and these are uh, V-belts. So this stuff's become antiquated because most everything is spring-loaded, unless we get really new Subarus and stuff where it's a stretch-to-fit be belt with no spring-loaded tensioning. Um, obviously, we want to be able to look for belt problems like these. Some cracks are considered to be normal, but what, even though they say this is normal, what I find is when you have a little bit of belt cracking, you tend to get, the, the belt tends to be dried out, and then it starts to get noisy and squeaky and things like that. Obviously, any issues like this, we would want to replace that belt. Um, and I think you guys remember in Auto 1 that we use those little orange um, gauges to put in the belt to see how deep the group, excuse me, of the belt were. This picture shows on a V-belt style 
belt, how we loosen the lock nut and pry the alternator out and tighten it. A more modern one like a Toyota or Honda, we loosen this 12 millimeter bolt and then turn this adjusting bolt and that pulls it out, tensioning the belt or pulls it in, uh, untensioning the belt. Subaru does the same thing. Most all Asian car manufacturers do the same thing. This is much preferred to this, of course. So the next thing we can do is scan for trouble codes to see if there's any diagnostic trouble codes that might be giving us an indication of some kind of problem in the charging system. One of the things we got to think about is, okay, is that a charging system problem? Is there a problem with our um, running voltage? Or, um, but, but a scan tool might give us a little more information, like maybe there's a, a, a circuit feeding the alternator that's not powering up correctly. But it's going to display charging system voltage and battery temperature on the scan tool. So um, let me pause here for a moment. We'll come back to charging system precautions in a moment. So whenever we're working on a charging system, we've got to follow some precautions. We're always going to disconnect the battery before doing any servicing. And we do that by disconnecting the negative battery cable. And that's all you need to disconnect to make sure there's no way of arcing anything when you're removing this alternator. Never reverse polarity. We're never going to swap the leads with jumper pack or jumper cables or battery cables because that would definitely pop some fuses and maybe hurt a module. We're not going to operate the alternator with the output disconnected. Don't ever take the... Don't do that. We used to do this years ago. We would start the car and you could remove the battery. You don't ever want to do that anymore um, uh, at all. So, or, or the wire off of the alternator because that could touch ground and whatever. And then never short of ground terminals, terminals unless instructed to do so by shop manual or service information. And that's something we used to do, and it will come up in this PowerPoint on uh, doing what's called a regulator bypass test. Um, it's not done much anymore, anyways. So here we go. So our charging system tests, we're gonna, we can check charging system voltage or running voltage, and we have done that, and we'll do that again. Uh, we can do what's called an alternator output test. I've done that, and you'll see it again here. Um, a, regular by, a regulator bypass test says, okay, if the alternator is not charging, if we bypass the regulator, let's see if the alternator now charges. If the re alternator now charges when the regulator is bypassed, we know the regulator is the issue for a no charging situation. If we bypass the regulator and it still doesn't charge, we know the alternator is bad. Um, scope testing. So there is a way to hook up the output of the alternator to a scope and look at a pattern and kind of determine uh, what it's doing. We don't do that much, uh, and technicians usually don't do that much, but it is a thing that can be done, and I just want you to be aware of it. Then circuit resistance tests that we can take measurements on the inside of the alternator. We'll look at that, and then we'll just look at some voltmeter testing. So let's get started with it. So um, an output test is going to measure system current and voltage under maximum load. So this is where we're stressing the alternator. We're, and like I, I already showed you, we call it an alternator output test. We're going to put the engine at 2,000 RPM. We're going to load with our um, um, VAT40 or with our AVR or some device that has a load capacity so we can suck power out of the the uh, we cook it to the battery, suck power out of the battery, and therefore the alternator is back feeding the battery. So we're essentially sucking power out of the alternator. So without letting the voltage fall below 12 volts at 2000 RPM, we read the maximum voltage. In the demonstration you already saw on that Tundra, we got 91 amps at 12 volts. You'll see another one here coming up. Um, a regulator bypass test, also called a full field alternator output test. Um, we perform this on an alternator that fails the alternator output test because we're trying to determine if the regulator is the problem or the alternator is the problem. So the regulator is essentially removed from the magnetic field circuit, which is the circuit feeding the rotor, and applying full vo voltage to the field. So we're removing the regulator, not physically taking it out, but bypassing it. And we use a screw, uh, screwdriver or a test tab to ground. We'll show you what that is. Or we can use a jumper wire sometimes. I'm just going to show this to you. We don't, we don't do this on modern cars anymore, but General Motors uh, alternators used to have what's called a D-hole. Well, we put a screwdriver in, touched the tab in there, and shorted it to the case. And that would eliminate the regulator's functioning, and then the alternator would charge maximum. So this just shows a little bypass jumper on the, our Ford uh, Windstar outside. 
uses this kind where you just use a little jumper wire to ground a tab on the back of the alternator and that bypasses the regulator, et cetera. Okay. Um, and this just says if the charging voltage and current increase to normal when the regulator is bypassed, it's a bad regulator. If the output remains the same, then you've got a bad alternator. You're only doing this test when you, your alternator fails an alternator output test. Now you're wondering, hey, do I got a bad voltage regulator or is it the alternator itself? Now all voltage regulators are almost all are inside the alternator except ones that are inside a PCM. Um, you can actually replace them. And if you were servicing an alternator on a big old giant caterpillar with a $500 alternator, uh, you may want to think about uh, diagnosing and fixing exactly what's wrong so you don't necessarily have to buy a new alternator. So this is scope testing. I'm, I'm going to go fast here. I'm going to say don't take any notes on this part other than to say that we can use a scope to look at the output of an alternator. So here's a handheld scope going to an alternator, and this is what we would see. We would see some sort of waveform, and based on that, we can see if the alternator is uh, working properly. I just want you to be exposed to it, so you really don't need to take any notes here. Um, just knowing that there is a way of graphically displaying a waveform to tell how uh, what the alternator's output is looking like. Voltmeter testing, you guys know that we can just look for uh, resting, sorry, for running voltage, and you know it should be 13 and a half to 14 and a half volts. Um, so let's bring all this up. So base voltage, it's just battery voltage with engine off, it should be 12.6 volts. No load voltage running, we know it should be 13 and a half to 14 and a half. A load voltage, when all the accessories are on, the voltage is going to drop down, but we want to we see it stay above 12 volts. Um, and charge voltage, which is uh, load voltage minus battery voltage, but uh, this is not something we usually talk about. All we're really usually talking about is battery resting voltage, running voltage, and what the amperage is at when we're at 12 volts and loading the alternator. Okay? So I'm just going to keep going here because this is stuff you guys know. There's nothing there to look at. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. So here's an automotive service or alternator service. So this just says, and you don't need to write anything down here. We're going to look at removal, disassembly components, assembly installation. So a little bit on removal. We're going to disconnect the battery. We're going to loosen the bolt. We're going to remove the belt. We're going to remove wires knowing their location. We're going to remove the bolts and the alternator. Shazam. You guys know that. So here we're just showing uh, we've disconnected the battery. We've unplugged the electrical to the stator. We've taken the belt off. We've unbolted. Now the alternator's out. And I'm going to do this in the video you'll see in just a moment. Um, here's some types of uh, way tools that we have, maybe for pulling a pulley off when we go to disassemble, taking the case bolts out and using a plastic mallet to take it apart, pulling the rotor out, looking at the bearings, how to unbolt the back bearing, or sorry, the front bearing to get it out. This is just showing some disassembly pictures and tips, etc. I'll pause for a moment so you can look at that. All right, so here's an alternator taken apart, and there's the rotor, there's the stator, there's the rectifier bridge. Uh, voltage regulator is not really being shown here, but there's a brush there and a brush there. There's a bearing in here, there's a bearing there. You're not seeing the voltage regulator in this, um, this picture. Just, by the way, it said, do not clean electrical parts solvent. We just wipe it out and blow it out with compress air. So on the rotor, um, we can look for a rotor. We can look for a bent shaft, scored slip rings that we can sand with sandpaper. So what we're doing there is, you know, we're looking at the rotor and we're saying, okay, is the shaft bent? Um, are there big, deep scores in the, in the uh, slip rings here? Do we need to sand them with sandpaper? You can see there's a little burn marks in here. And, and so on. Here's some of the tests that we can do on a rotor. So we're going to check a short to ground test where we take an ohm meter and touch the end of the shaft and touch one of the slip rings. So we'll touch here to here, and we should get uh, infinite resistance or OL, which is out of limits. And then we'll touch here to here in the same. We don't want to see any resistance. We want to see an infinite amount. Sorry, we don't want to see it any um, continuity, you want to see an infinite resistance. 
And then an open circuit test, we're just going to check from slip ring to slip ring, and we want to see 2 to 4 amps. We don't want to see infinite resistance, because that means that would mean that the coil that goes from one slip ring to the other was broken or cut. So we want to see 2 to 4 ohms uh, through the, the rotor coil. And then we can put um, hook a battery up and put an ammeter and see how much current flows through that rotor to give us a, a better measurement of the state of the rotor current, uh, rotor coil than an ohm meter would give. On a stator, we can, they all have, stators can have um, shorts or opens or they can be burned. So I'll go back for just a moment. Um, so we're gonna, we can have an open circuit where the stator winding's open, we're burned open, shorted coils so we have no enough resistance, melted insulation off of the stator windings, and we can use an ohm meter to check for opens and grounds. So we'll show you how to do that right here. We'll take an ohm meter, we can touch from this lead to this lead, touch from this lead to this lead, touch from this lead to the case. A and B would be looking for opens and we would want to see a, uh, maybe an ohm or half an ohm of resistance. And here we're looking for grounds and we don't want to see any continuity grounds, so we would like to see OL here between the stator lead and the metal case. That would be checking for a ground. We can go ahead and check diodes. Um, I'm not going to take the time to look at those notes. I don't want you to take notes, but we can just take an ohm meter and we take an ohm meter on the ohm setting and then there's a button you push to configure it for diode testing and it does a voltage drop on the diode. So we go from the diode to the case ground and we should get, usually we'll get like about a half a volt one way. And then when we reverse the leads, we should get, we should get OL or infinite, uh, no, no voltage. You should say OL. So one way we should have a, a, a very, very a, a low reading and one way a very, very high reading. Um, and that's normally what we get when we check a diode. Okay, so an open diode has high resistance in both directions. A shorted diode has low resistance in both directions. And a good one um, is going to have uh, low voltage in one direction and, and infinite in another direction. So we can change the bearings, that's all it's saying. I'm just gonna, there's nothing fancy, no reason to, to um, belabor that. And we can change brushes. And again, no, nothing fancy, you don't need to write it down. We're just gonna replace the bearings, the, the uh, front one here, that's, oh, sorry, that's the, that looks like the back one there and the front one there. And then the brushes are right there and there. And these are normal wearing items that we replace. Okay. So um, I will clip something to this here in just one second. All right, you guys, I want to show you by going over to uh, Mitchell ProDemand. When we are diagnosing a charging system concern, one of the things that we need to look at is the wiring diagram to make sure that we know if there's any fuses that feed the, the alternator, the voltage regulator, that they are good and that power is being fed into the alternator. So I'm IDing a 2003 um, Toyota Tundra access cab SR5 rear wheel drive standard transmit. Oh, I'm sorry, automatic transmission. Let me reset the options there one sec. Rear wheel drive automatic transmission uh, with a 3.4 liter V6. And if I go over to wiring diagrams and I go to starting charging, um, go down here to starting charging, and I get the charging system picture. So it says charging system circuit. And find the battery if you can. Uh, did I already pass it there? No, nope, there's the battery right there. This is the battery here. And um, the battery is going to go up and go into this big old alternator fuse. It's either 140 amp or 100 amp. The one and the two are going to be, one is if it has a towing package, two without towing package. This is These two fuses, this alternator S fuse 7.5, these are the fuses that are in the engine room uh, relay box on the left side of the engine compartment. So driver's side of the engine compartment that can be bad and can cause the alternator not to function. These are the fuses that get blown many times, or at least this big one does, gets blown many times when people hook up jumper cables incorrectly or hook up a jumper pack incorrectly. So we would want to make sure, you can see this black one, 
this black one feeds to the, the generator or alternator to the battery terminal. This is the big heavy cable. So we can check with a test light here and make sure we have power. This white wire comes from this alternator SFU 7.5. We would want to make sure that there's power here. And over here, we've got a gauge fuse 10 amp that feeds through a junction and to the alternator ignition terminal here. And then this L terminal, we have a 5 amp ignition fuse. These are both are from the driver's side uh, junction box below the left side of the dash. So this fuse box is in the left side interior. This one's in the engine compartment. But this ignition fuse is going to go through a warning light and then it's going to go through a junction and into the alternator. So I can unplug the, the there's a connector that has these three wires in it and then this is a separate one or I can go to these fuse boxes and check these fuses. The best way to do it is to just check with a test light here, then unplug this three pin connector and check here, here, and here, and see if they're all powered up. Um, because if one of those weren't, then that case, the alternator itself would not work. And we had a situation recently on a Toyota where um, it wasn't charging, and it turns out this 100 amp fuse was bad because somebody had jumpered it um, with jumper cables and did not. Um, and did it backwards and blew the fuse. And we figured it out by checking for voltage on these terminals. The alternator wasn't charging, battery light was on. Checking these terminals and we found that uh, this one did not have power coming from the, the battery. And so we traced it back to this alternator fuse. So I want you to see that on the wiring diagram. It's something we need to look at when we get an alternator that's not charging to make sure that it's not a fuse before we go and condemn the alternator. All right, that's it for now.